Jeff, are you going to uh, be able to share your screen and do the presentation for us? We're ready when you're ready, and then we'll do some questions from the trustees after, if that's okay. Perfect. Yeah, great. I will pop it up on the screen. Uh, is it up? Can you all see it yet? Yes. Excellent. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, glad to be here virtually. Uh, I think, let's see. Briefly, uh, just to let you know who I am, I'm Jeff Dickinson. I'm uh, with SB Friedman Development Advisors. Uh, we are a consulting firm that works on public-private development projects um, and have a particular expertise in TIF designations, among other things. Uh, happy to present a little bit of context uh, about TIF generally, then a little bit about the particulars uh, of this proposed TIF district, and then to field your questions, whatever they may be. Can I just pause for a quick second? Sure. I don't I don't know about any of the other board members, but I know that's facing out. So the public I have a hard time hearing him. I don't know if anybody else can hear him clearly. It's muffled on our side. Okay. Let me it's see. not you, Jeff. It's our it's our end. It's oh, okay. Nothing. I was gonna say we'll, I'm almost we'll never muffled, but that's a you know it's usually nope. technology that you can I don't. So let, let's hope, I don't want to do the same to you that just happened to me. So if anybody can't hear clearly in the audience, let us know. Just raise your hand and we'll try to make an adjustment. Sorry, Jeff, go ahead. No problem. Thank you, Mayor. So briefly, uh, just an overview of what is tax increment financing. Uh, this is, you know, just at a summary level, it is a flexible public-private financial tool controlled by local governments. So it's a, it's a way to generate money and it's controlled by village board, city councils. Um, the tool was established or enabled by state legislation to support deteriorating or economically underperforming portions of cities, municipalities, however you want to describe it. So it's a targeted tool um, to be used to solve specific challenges. Uh, lots of parts of lots of towns never see a TIF district because they're doing just fine. But the places that aren't developing uh, in the way that communities um, are seeking and also, insofar as the facts satisfy state law, uh, municipalities can use TIF to try to have a source of funds to try to solve other uh, economic development challenges. So eliminating blight, growing the tax base, uh, growing employment, those are all public policy goals that municipalities tend, some one or more of those tends to apply. Why, why would you create a TIF district? What, what's the, at the high level, what are we trying to do as a community uh, sort of thinking? Um, the source of funds that it, where the money comes from is property taxes, incremental property taxes. It's not a tax increase, but it essentially diverts taxes that otherwise wouldn't have been created um, and puts them into a special tax allocation fund. That fund is controlled by the village board and they make decisions on how to spend the money uh, in the best ways to achieve the goals of the community and the goals of the TIF district. Um, I guess I said the tax increase thing first, but that's a, an important thing. It's a diversion, not a, the rate doesn't change. The valuations only change when development occurs, obviously, but that would have happened anyhow. So that's TIF in a nutshell. To see what it looks like uh, from a picture point of view, I guess, uh, the value of properties when a TIF is created is frozen. So there's a vertical dashed line there. Uh, and at that point, um, the taxes are essentially frozen on the parcels in the district. So the taxing bodies, the schools, the county, the village, everybody keeps getting the taxes they were getting before on the frozen base value. Uh, but insofar as there is growth in tax value, which of course is what we're always hoping for, and that there, therefore there is growth in taxes, you get into the orange portion of the chart. And those funds are the ones that go into the TIF fund, the special tax allocation fund that I mentioned. <laughs> it lasts 23 years. Uh, and then the second dash line to the right there, the district expires and the whole tax base becomes available to all of the taxing bodies. So in that orange period, the taxes are diverted to the TIF fund and the village uses those funds to make good things happen. But at the end of the life of the TIF, um, and that statutory light life is 23 years, some you can close them early. Um, it is legal to ask that the state extend them, but the normal life of a TIF is 23 years. And once it's over, you get into the tall teal, hopefully. Uh, just broadly speaking, how, it is a complicated process, and in order to use TIF, it takes a couple of steps. So the process so far, and the report that is put on was put on file, is is 
the eligibility study and the redevelopment plan. Um, it's got, as I say, two parts, parts one and two. Question one is, does the area qualify under state law? Um, we conducted some research and I'll talk about the details of that. Ultimately concluded that yes, the area could be put into a TIF district if the board so chose. Um, we then worked with staff and developed a redevelopment plan. So now that you have a TIF district, what are you gonna do with it? It's That plan is pretty general. Uh, the, probably the most important fact, and again, I'll talk to the details later, is there's a budgetary cap on spending it's not a it's not a levy amount but there's there's a cap on spending and that's the you know there's other material issues but it's a pretty broad plan it's intended this whole tool is intended to support village land use policy it's not a policy land use policy document it's a financial tool essentially and so the tiff plan is is not overly specific about what should should go where that that occurs in other village sort of land use regulatory and, and planning exercises uh, our homework our work my firm's work is in there. We made our conclusions and our findings. Uh, villages, including your board, can rely on that work and say SB Friedman did this homework. They have concluded that the area qualifies, um, that the report is satisfy state law. There's some rules about different things that need to be in there. Um, what this report doesn't do, it doesn't force the board to spend any money. It, it, it says our report says this area could be a TIF, and here's a con here's a conforming plan for that TIF district should the board adopt it. Future decisions by the board would be to actually create the TIF, that's their choice, enter into any agreements to spend TIF dollars. So none of that is on the table yet. Uh, that That is just to now, to the current document that's on file with the clerk is, here's the plan and here's why we believe it qualifies. Um, it's a two to three month uh, notice and approval process per state law, so you don't just put the plan on file and approve it the next meeting. Um, the state gives a fair bit of, uh, requires a fair bit of engagement through mailings and this meeting and other meetings, a joint review board meeting with tax and bodies to make sure that it, everyone gets to understand what's happening um, and, and get their two cents into the into the equation. So to the particulars, uh, again, this is just a summary of the, doc, the document that is perhaps on your desks or in your hands or certainly at the, in the clerk's office. Um, this is the boundary, uh, it's 42 parcels, about 860 acres. Uh, it is vacant land. Uh, there are it's literally all vacant land. There's no buildings anywhere. Um, when you're looking at vacant land, there are two different sets of rules in the state law about eligibility. There's rules for vacant parcels. Uh, since those are the only kind of parcels we have, um, we looked at those rules to see if the area qualified. Um, the one factor test is one way to get there. We found based on a study performed by the village's engineer that the area qualified under one of the one factor tests. Um, so our our job was to compile analyze data. We created some maps, as you can see. We conducted some field work to confirm the conditions, specifically that the, all the parcels were vacant. Um, we worked with EEI, the village's engineer, and got them to prepare a memo about runoff, water runoff, which is part of the state law. And we looked at the village's comp plan, uh, because the TIF plan has to basically conform to the comp plan. It can't disagree. Um, fundamentally, the finding is the, the EEI study said that 88% of the runoff from the proposed TIF area contributes to flooding in the watershed. That meets the one factor test um, and 88% is obviously almost all of it. So we found that to be meaningfully present and reasonably distributed. Um, you have to make other findings um, that the area has not seen significant growth and development. I think, you know, given that it's a bunch of blank dirt, that is true. But for the creation of the TIF, um, development wouldn't happen. If you believe that you can get significant development without a TIF district, I would say don't create it. Uh, I don't believe that that is true here, given the significant infrastructure, lack of infrastructure to almost every bit of this whole area. There just isn't enough infrastructure to support development. So without the TIF, it wouldn't otherwise develop. That is a true statement. Um, the parcels have to be contiguous and be expected to substantially benefit. That is the shape is contiguous and, and we believe they would substantially benefit. The land, the land use plan and the TIF plan has to agree with the land use plan and the comprehensive plan. It does, there's no housing, so there's no housing impact. And you have to estimate when it'll complete. That's just a, essentially a math exercise. Um, Twenty-three years from the, to the end of the year. The plan has objectives, as I mentioned earlier. These are pretty high level. Facilitate essentially new construction and development. Foster replacement and extension of infrastructure, stormwater detention, landscaping, site preparation, 
support other plans and, and support the use of other funds. So these are pretty much, you know, pretty high level objectives. Uh, the details, the devil's in the details, obviously, but the TIF plan wants to be flexible and accommodating. And, and then the future decisions by the board would get into the real nitty gritty of, of these types of things. 23 years is a long time. So being overly specific in a TIF plan is not usually a very good idea because it's odd, the odds of it being wrong are pretty good after a couple of years, especially. Plan must include a budget. This is, as I said earlier, a maximum spend. Uh, there is fungibil fungibility across line items. So the biggest line item here is construction of public works, as you can see. That is a known deficiency. That is where we believe most, almost, you know, whatever, this is two thirds of the money will go. That's a plausible guess. It could be more than that. It could be 225 million, it could be 180 million, you know, TBD, but the lion's share of the money will go to public you know, infrastructure costs or public works. Um, the village, can move money around. So again, if it turns out they want to spend $51,000 on job training, that's conceivable. Uh, that would be okay as long as they don't exceed the cap, overall cap. So you can move numbers up and down across these line items. But these are roughly in proportion to where we think the majority of the costs are. Site preparation, also that's grading and other things, sort of the pre-development you know, type or, or land development phases, just getting the place ready to go. And then the buildings go up, buildings are not eligible costs and buildings um, should be able to be built without any direct subsidy, generally speaking. Um, but the site and the infrastructure is essentially absent or not set up properly. Future land use, as I said, this is not over superseding zoning. This isn't superseding planning. It's essentially, we've essentially drafted it as this is a very flexible uh, land use. Uh, commercial can go in here, business park can go, flex, residential flex, single family housing, parks and open space. Basically, almost any land use essentially. So this isn't very prescriptive. It's just saying, look, the plan is open to different uses of the funds. Usually this is a, a, a map and a TIF plan that tries to narrow the land uses, but in this case, because essentially all land uses are on the table, uh, all the land uses are in the TIF plan. Um, that's that's the logic there. And, and again, the actual decisions about what goes where are very important. And the TIF plan is just not the place where those decisions are documented or, or made. It's it's made separately through the entitlement process and other other village processes. This is a little glimpse of the process, just to point out the timeframes. The, the report was filed uh, about a month ago. Um, we're at this meeting today. The joint review board meeting uh, has not yet been scheduled, but it is required to be and will be scheduled with all of the affected taxing bodies. Um, that's probably in about January. Then there'll be a public hearing that'll be noticed, noticed and held um, with this village board, presumably in this very room. Um, and then the soonest there's likely to be village board consideration of creating the TIF district would be in March. These are estimates. We've got to hammer down the details and get the schedule formalized. But it, the, I guess the point of the slide is it's not an overnight decision. It's it's going to take several months and, and there'll be several more bites of the apple uh, for the board and for other people to to pipe up about their thoughts. And that's what I've got. Thank you. <clears throat> um. Let's start with, first of all, you can still clearly hear us, right? Jeff? I can. Okay. I, I just want to remind the board members, he only can hear you if you're speaking into your microphone. So if you have a question, please lean, lean in. Okay. I know that Heidi, I don't know if you want to lead off. Sorry, I didn't mean to catch you off guard. <laughs> she has a few questions. Great. Did you hear him? I'm sorry. No, he didn't no. hear you. <laughs> Is your mic on? <laughs> okay. Can you hear me now? I can. Okay. Good. Okay. So, is it my understanding that the item is vacant land? TIF eligible, the main bulk of it is that, flood, that the engineering report states that property contributes to flooding of the Blackberry Creek watershed. Is that correct? 
Yes. All right. I know I have a lot of questions on that because take up with the engineer, but it, it appears to me, according to what the Blackberry Creek watershed is, quite a bit of Sugar Grove and everywhere else. I, I'm not sure if it's all of the farmland that doesn't have pension that contributes to it because Blackberry Creek watershed is darn large. So I missed I missed I, the last bit there. I'm sorry. The Blackberry Creek watershed is pretty darn large, and I'm just wondering: are other vacant farmlands that don't have like retention ponds would they meet that same criteria? Or I I can take that up with the engineer because I have separate questions on that. I'm just that's the main criteria for this. I question. Yeah, is EEI at the meeting, or I, I can take a, a swing at it as a non-technical person, but if they're there, I'd obviously they know better than I do. They're not here, Jeff. They're not. Okay. I mean, I guess the short answer is I think you're probably right. I think, I, I, again, I, I haven't looked. We, we basically asked the EI to look at this land only, but my limited non-engineering understanding of it is water runs off of cornfields or dirt or whatever, and it goes into some watershed by definition. Unless there's, as you said, some sort of stormwater management facility. And so I would guess if there's land similar to this in the same watershed, not in this study area, it also probably contributes to flooding in the watershed. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you again. I lost oh, I'm it. sorry, under that one definition, I guess I, I question how many other properties, farmland would fall into that. But back, I'll talk to Amy. Um, one of the other questions I had involved um, line items. On, mm -hmm. Because if we're looking at the main reason this is developed or can't be developed is because Essentially, it's farmland that runs down, the water runs downhill and watershed. So if we need to put retention ponds in there, this is just the retention pond on these line items. When would we be able to get that information? It was kind of breaking up and coming in and out, but I guess the, the plan is required to provide for stormwater detention. And I, I suspect, I can, again, I can't speak for the build, the village's, you know, zoning folks, but I would suspect that that would be required as a part of redevelopment. So there would be, I presume, significant progress on the problem that is in place if development were to occur. There'd be significantly less runoff if it were basically houses and other things because you have to manage your stormwater properly. So it would, it would I think, again, an engineer would know better, but it would make that a problem significantly improved I think oddly enough you know development is better than cornfields for that watershed I would if I were to informally say that you know okay I, and I, I apologize if I, you know I do a lot of research on you know fits to try to get myself familiarized with it um I was just trying to figure out if the main problem is the water can we just get a I lost you at the end I'm sorry you said uh, if the main problem is the water then something On your report, it wasn't looked water um, pension or water stormwater um, remediation. It just had public works. I was just wondering if you had a had that separated since water uh, remediation is the main issue that makes this help. Yeah, in the goals, it's in there uh, as a specific with the words, you know, construction of stormwater management systems and flood control. Um, from a budgetary point of view, and this is just me, I'm sorry to be such a twitty person about it, the, the names of the things in the budget are literally the words in the state law. So we we don't get too creative with those line items because we want to make sure that the plan is conforming to the statute. So if you unpack what is behind site preparation, uh, I think there's additional words that I can't do off the top of my head, but that's where private stormwater ponds could go, for example, as an eligible cost. So we have $100 million for that. That would be a reimbursement, I believe, under that line item. If it's public improvements of detention ponds that are village owned and village maintained, 
that would be a public work. So there, again, two different rows I think would would cover the two different types of stormwater management. And again, but that's just trying to make sure it's it's a one to one with the statute. So there's no ambiguity as to what those rows mean. At least the, the, at least it's clear that they are consistent with the powers under state act, the TIF Act. I can't hear anything right now. I have I'm one sorry. question on on the timing on this. I know that there is an amendment in the House, uh, Senate Bill uh, 191. Are you familiar with that? The amendment to um, the tax increments, basically to the fact uh, amendment. Yeah. Development Act, and I didn't know if you were taking into account whether or not that if that passes. Does that? How does that affect us? Didn't know if you were aware of that. Yeah, we keep an eye on that. Um, there's usually almost every session there's some kind of TIF bill kicking around in Springfield. Um, we we do all of our work based on the law as it is today. So you know, as long as it's still a bill, you know, we're aware of it, but we don't try to write to bills. Uh, because we just don't no, know what's going to no, be made a law. I no, I know that. I didn't. Was asking if you were next to village, if you had. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. You know, when we come, you know, when these bills come across, some of them are a little bit, you know, they have some significant, you know, amendments. We have to redo uh, our study or we have to redo our planning. I didn't know if you that. Yeah, the timeline for adoption, I think, would get your concerns. I, I understand it. I hear it. You know, I think if, if the board wants to approve this TIF in March, I, I don't know exactly. Probably somebody in that room knows better than me when the legislature is back in session, but I think it's April. And so if you were to approve the TIF in March, my understanding is the current law would be the law, uh, you know, at least in that moment. So uh, there's certainly it's something to be sensitive to, but I think if there's going to be a TIF amendment approved, passed, it probably wouldn't occur until April or May or something of next year. So you, you know, you, we wouldn't have to be, you'd be under the current law, I believe. But if Kathy was around, she uh, knows this back of her hand kind of stuff. So. And I just make a comment that and maybe this helps Jeff, but um, your question regarding expenses and where they fall. You'll see that level of detail if we get to a redevelopment agreement. Yeah. You'll see that broken out when you, if, if and when that ever gets in front of the village board, you'll have their detail in a request format of where, where the expenses are, what, where they fall. And that what Jeff has is per state statute, what bucket they fall into, and that's where he's put those funds. Yeah. Okay. Any other board members have? Questions for Jeff. Yeah, I got a quick follow up uh, on on that. Right. So something went into the findings um, related to 220 million, for example, for uh, site preparation or construction, whatever. However, it's worded there. I'm guessing there is a top line sort of descriptor as far as how that was calculated. Um, what went in to create that 220, uh, as well as all the other line items. Um, uh, when are we going to see? You mentioned a development agreement. That's after an arrangement, right? So something went in to create those top line top line numbers. I I think I'd just like to see the next level down. What are the major categories, uh, and how much was allocated for them? Yeah, we've seen developer budgets. So so that is part of it. We've done tax projections on behalf of the village as well, based on the some of the site plans and the yields essentially the, the square footages and building counts and things like that so so it's it's the, the revenue number the 350 total is a function lar largely of our tax projections which were done you know based i guess oh, i say okay. on their okay. and then and then we apportion them like i said you can move them around anywhere you want so we could put 220 million dollars in job training now that's obviously okay. insane so we're not going to so do that was that. A, it, it, just in summary that's that's uh it's more of a top down calculation than a bottom up 
right? So I, I think where Heidi and I are coming from as engineers, you know, we create a, a project budget based on yeah. all the individual costs to get us there. Um, this is coming from the other the other end. Here's uh, the impact of the you know of the finances, and here's how we suppose they may be divvied up uh, around these categories. That's okay, right. And then, as, as as the mayor said, when we get down to the brass tacks of a deal, these numbers go from foggy and estimated to much less foggy and much less estimated. It, but Got it's it. just it's at, at this moment it's and, and this is a an interesting case. Sometimes we do these, and there isn't really a project even you know in the in the gestational stages. And so these numbers are even more sort of speculative. So they're pretty good estimates, but they are still, you know, and they're they're generally high estimates at this point for this document because you can't you don't want to be low. Obviously, we don't want to spend more money than we have to on the village side. So when the deal comes, you know, you want to screw those numbers down. But at this point, we just we need to create headroom essentially with the TIF plan. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Any other questions? I think we need engineering enterprises to come in and talk about flooding issue because that's the one basis that this is all being determined off of. And I'd like to hear the explanation as well. Good, okay. Any other comments? We'll have that done next meeting. All right, Jeff, I, I, I don't think anybody has anything further. So I appreciate your time as usual. Thank you for joining virtually tonight. Happy to be here. Good talking to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff.